IMU Publications presents The Mind of Leonardo da Vinci by Sigmund Freud Curated and modernized from Leonardo da Vinci, A Memory of His Childhood by Sigmund Freud, which was published in 1916 and in the public domain. Chapter 1 Whenever I psychoanalyze anybody famous or distinguished, I am not motivated by the reasons commonly assumed by the average person. I do not aim to tarnish their reputation or bring greatness down to a lower level. Instead, I believe that everything worth understanding can be observed through the study of these exceptional figures. I recognize that even the greatest individuals are subject to the same laws that govern normal and abnormal behavior. As for Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519, he was highly regarded by his contemporaries as one of the greatest figures of the Italian Renaissance, although his enigmatic nature remained a mystery to them. Leonardo was a versatile genius, excelling as both an artist and a naturalist. While he left behind masterpieces in painting, his scientific discoveries remained unpublished and unutilized. His inclination towards scientific investigations often overshadowed his artistic pursuits, leading to challenges and perhaps even suppression of his artistic endeavors. According to Vasari, Leonardo felt remorse during his final moments for not fulfilling his artistic duties. Although Vasari's account may include legendary elements that developed during Leonardo's lifetime, it still provides valuable insight into the perceptions of that era. So what caused Leonardo's contemporaries to struggle in understanding him? It was not his multifaceted abilities or his outward appearance, as he was physically striking, charming, and affectionate. He appreciated beauty, dressed elegantly, and valued refinement. In his treatise on painting, he contrasted the arduous work of a sculptor with the comfort and pleasure of a painter. Leonardo enjoyed the company of others, music, and literature, free from the noise and physical strain associated with sculpting. However, as the years passed and Leonardo faced challenges such as having to leave Milan and lead an unstable life until finding refuge in France, his disposition may have changed, and certain peculiarities of his character became more prominent. His growing interest in science, which competed with his artistic endeavors, also contributed to the widening gap between himself and his contemporaries. His unconventional pursuits, such as dissecting cadavers and developing flying machines, diverged from the prevailing doctrines of Aristotle and aligned him more closely with the despised alchemists of the time. These factors affected his paintings, leading to a reduced enthusiasm for practicing his craft. Many of his works remained unfinished, and he seemed increasingly indifferent to their fate. While such behavior is not uncommon among artists, it was particularly pronounced in Leonardo. Accounts of his meticulously deliberate work process combined with the multitude of sketches and studies he left behind suggest that a lack of focus or inconsistency did not greatly impact his artistic dedication. Instead, there was an intense absorption in his work, a wealth of possibilities that made decision-making challenging, and an inhibition in execution that surpassed the typical gap between an artist's vision and the final result. Leonardo's slow pace of work was notable from the beginning and foreshadowed his eventual turn away from painting. For instance, his choice of oil colors over fresco painting contributed to the deterioration of the Last Supper due to their separation from the wall. Similarly, the Calvary battle painting in the Sala del Concilio in Florence was left unfinished and eventually perished, likely due to technical issues stemming from Leonardo's experimental interests. Leonardo's character displayed other intriguing traits and apparent contradictions. Despite living in a time when assertiveness and competition were valued, he stood out for his peacefulness, avoiding conflicts and controversies. He exhibited kindness towards animals, refusing to eat meat out of a sense of justice for their lives, and enjoyed releasing caged birds. He condemned war and violence, considering humans to be the worst of all wild beasts. However, this sensitive nature did not stop him from observing and sketching the faces of condemned criminals on their way to execution, nor did it prevent him from inventing cruel weapons or working as a chief military engineer for Cesare Borgia. Leonardo sometimes appeared indifferent to moral distinctions or had a different set of values. He held a significant position in Cesare's successful campaign to conquer the Romagna, despite Cesare being an untrustworthy and ruthless adversary. Leonardo's sketches from that time show no indication of criticizing or sympathizing with the events. A comparison to Goethe's behavior during the French campaign may also be relevant in this context. If a biography truly aims to understand the inner life of its subject, 
It should not shy away from discussing their sexual activity or peculiarities, which are often ignored or glossed over due to discretion or prudishness. In Leonardo's case, we have limited knowledge, but with significant implications. In a time of conflicting extremes between excessive promiscuity and gloomy asceticism, Leonardo stood out for his apparent disinterest in sexual matters, which is unexpected for an artist who often portrayed feminine beauty. Leonardo expressed his frigidity in the following statement. The act of procreation and everything that has any relation to it is so disgusting that human beings would soon die out if it were not a traditional custom and if there were no pretty faces and sensuous dispositions. His posthumous works, encompassing profound scientific topics as well as seemingly insignificant subjects, such as allegorical natural history, animal fables, witticisms, prophecies, are remarkably chaste, almost abstinent, in a way that would even surprise the readers of his time. They deliberately avoid any sexual content, as if the scientific pursuit of knowledge had no interest in the domain of Eros, the force that sustains all living beings. It is well known how often great artists found pleasure in expressing their fantasies through erotic and even obscenely graphic representations. In contrast, Leonardo left behind only anatomical drawings of female internal genitals, fetal positioning in the womb, and similar subjects. It's unclear whether Leonardo ever had a romantic relationship with a woman, and there is no evidence of an intimate spiritual connection with a woman like Michelangelo had with Vittoria Colonna. During his time as an apprentice, Leonardo was accused of engaging in forbidden homosexual activities with other young men, but was acquitted. He came under suspicion because he employed a young man with a bad reputation as a model. As a master, Leonardo surrounded himself with attractive boys and young men whom he took as pupils. His last pupil, Francesco Melzi, accompanied him to France, stayed with him until his death, and was named as his heir. While I do not dogmatically reject the possibility of a sexual relationship between Leonardo and his pupils, as his other biographers do, it is more likely that his affectionate relationships with these young men did not involve sexual activity. He should not be regarded as a highly sexual person. The unique aspect of Leonardo's emotional and sexual life, considering his dual nature as an artist and investigator, can only be understood in one way. Among the biographers, Edmondo Solmi is the only one who has approached the solution to this puzzle from a psychological perspective. However, writer Dmitry Sergeyevich Merikovsky, who depicted Leonardo in an historical novel, also understood this extraordinary man and expressed his thoughts in a poetic manner. Solmi describes Leonardo as follows. But the unrequited desire to understand everything surrounding him, and with cold reflection to discover the deepest secret of everything that is perfect, has condemned Leonardo's works to remain forever unfinished. According to Leonardo, one has no right to love or to hate anything if one has not acquired a thorough knowledge of its nature. This sentiment is repeated in Leonardo's treatise on the art of painting, where he appears to defend himself against accusations of not having firm Christian beliefs. But such censurers might better remain silent, for that action is the manner of showing the workmaster so many wonderful things, and this is the way to love so great a discoverer. For verily great love springs from great knowledge of the beloved object, and if you little know it, you will be able to love it only little or not at all. The value of Leonardo's statements lies not in their accuracy as psychological facts, as they are clearly false, and Leonardo must have known this just as we do. It is not true that people wait to love or hate until they have analyzed and understood the nature of the person they have feelings for. In reality, people love or hate spontaneously, guided by emotions that have nothing to do with rational thinking. In fact, these emotions are often weakened by overthinking. Leonardo may have meant that the love people commonly experience is not ideal or desirable. He suggests that love should be restrained and subjected to intellectual examination before fully embracing it. Leonardo likely applied this approach himself and believes that others should also consider treating love and hatred in the same manner. And it appears that this was truly the case for him. He had control over his emotions and was driven by a curiosity to investigate the source of his feelings of love or hatred. He questioned the reasons behind his emotions and their significance, which initially led him to appear indifferent towards good and evil, beauty and ugliness. As he engaged in this investigation, his love and hatred transformed into intellectual interest. In reality, Leonardo was not devoid of passion. He possessed the divine spark that drives human activity. However, he channeled this passion into curiosity. He devoted himself to studying with unwavering persistence and profound depth, fueled by his passion. When he reached a pinnacle of understanding, having gained knowledge, he allowed his pent-up emotions to be released freely, much like a branch of a river flowing after completing its task. 
In moments of profound insight, when he could grasp a significant part of the whole, he was overwhelmed by a sense of awe and used ecstatic words to praise the magnificence of the aspect of creation he was studying, or, in a religious context, the greatness of the Creator. Solmi accurately recognized this transformative process in Leonardo and wrote the following. This transfiguration of the science of nature into, I would almost say, religious emotion is one of the characteristic features of da Vinci's manuscripts and is found expressed a hundred and a hundred times. Leonardo was nicknamed the Italian Faust because of his relentless and tireless desire for exploration. Even if we set aside the connection between the desire for exploration and the joys of life depicted in the Faust tragedy, it's worth noting that Leonardo's way of thinking resembles Spinoza's. The conversion of mental energy into various forms of activity is as challenging as converting physical energy. Leonardo's example demonstrates the need to pursue numerous other aspects within these processes. Waiting to love until one fully understands the object of affection entails a harmful delay. When one finally attains understanding, they are no longer capable of proper love or hatred. They remain detached from such emotions. Instead of experiencing love, they have engaged in investigation. Perhaps this is why Leonardo's life lacked the richness of love found in the lives of other great individuals and artists. The intense and consuming passions that often define the best part of others' lives seem to have eluded him. When someone follows Leonardo's advice, they shift from being active and productive to becoming an investigator. As they start to comprehend the vastness of the universe and its needs, they often forget about their own insignificance. Their admiration and humility make them overlook the fact that they are also a part of the living force and have the right to contribute to changing the course of the world. In this world, even the ordinary and small things are as marvelous and significant as the great ones. Solmi believes that Leonardo's investigations began with his art. He sought to understand light, color, shades, and perspective to become a master of imitating nature and guiding others. Initially, he may have overestimated the value of this knowledge for artists. However, driven by the needs of painting, he ventured into studying animals, plants, proportions of the human body, and their inner structure and biological functions. These aspects, which are also reflected in their appearance and should be depicted in art, led him further. Eventually, his curiosity extended beyond the boundaries of art, leading him to uncover general laws of mechanics and unravel the history of the Arno Valley's stratification and fossilization. His investigations spanned various fields of natural science where he was a pioneer, or at least a visionary. However, his focus remained on the external world, leaving little room for the study of human psychology in the Academy of Inciana, where he created intricate artistic emblems. When he tried to return to his art after his investigations, he felt unsettled by his shifting interests and the changed nature of his creative work. Where before he would focus on a specific problem in painting, he now would see other broader problems emerging from his endless investigations of natural history. He couldn't limit his artistic demands anymore or isolate the artwork from its larger context. Despite his greatest efforts to express everything within him and his related thoughts, he was forced to leave his work unfinished or declare it incomplete. The investigator that had been developing within him now dominated the artist, becoming stronger and suppressing his creativity. When we encounter a portrait of a person with one prominent and highly developed impulse, like Leonardo da Vinci's curiosity, we look for an explanation in their unique makeup. However, little is known about the likely organic basis for this inclination. Based on our psychoanalytic studies of individuals with nervous disorders, we expect two conditions to be present in such cases. Firstly, we assume that this intense impulse was active in the person's early childhood and was shaped by childhood experiences. Secondly, we propose that the impulse originally drew on sexual energy for reinforcement, eventually replacing a part of their sexual life. This means that individuals with such inclinations might passionately pursue investigations similar to how others pursue romantic love. We believe that sexual reinforcement not only applies to investigative impulses, but also to other intense impulses. Observing daily life, we see that many people can channel a significant portion of their sexual energy into their professional or business activities. The sexual impulse is particularly suited for such redirection because it can undergo sublimation, meaning it can exchange its immediate goals for higher value goals that are non-sexual. We consider this process to be verified if the person's childhood history or psychological development reveals that this powerful impulse serves sexual interests during childhood. 
Further confirmation is found in a noticeable reduction of sexual activity in adulthood, as if a part of the sexual energy has been replaced by the dominant impulse. Applying these assumptions to the case of the predominant investigative impulse presents certain challenges, as it may be difficult to accept that such a serious impulse exists in children or that children display notable sexual interests. However, these difficulties can be addressed. The relentless questioning and curiosity seen in young children demonstrate their curiosity, which puzzles adults until they understand that these questions are just roundabout ways of asking a single question the child doesn't articulate. As children grow older and gain more understanding, this manifestation of curiosity suddenly disappears. Psychoanalytic investigation provides an explanation for this by revealing that many, if not most, children, especially those who are gifted, go through a period around the age of three that can be described as a phase of infantile sexual investigation. Curiosity is not spontaneously aroused in children of this age, but is triggered by significant experiences such as the birth of a sibling or fear related to external events that threaten their egotistic interests. Their investigations revolve around the question of where children come from, as if the child is seeking ways to protect himself from an undesirable event. Surprisingly, children strongly reject the explanations given to them, such as the mythical stork story, and this act of disbelief marks their intellectual independence. They often feel at odds with adults and hold resentment for being deceived about the truth. They conduct investigations in their own way, forming theories about children's origins related to food, being born through the bowels, and the enigmatic role of the father. Even at this stage, they have a vague understanding of the sexual act, which appears hostile and violent to them. However, since their own reproductive abilities are not yet capable of creating children, their investigation into the origins of children also fails and remains incomplete. The impact of this initial failure to achieve intellectual independence appears to be persistent and profoundly disheartening. If a person's exploration of sexuality in childhood is abruptly halted due to strong sexual repression, it can have three different outcomes for their future curiosity. First, the curiosity may suffer the same fate as sexuality, remaining suppressed and limiting intellectual freedom throughout life. This often happens due to religious taboos and strict education, leading to neurotic inhibition. This mental weakness can contribute to the development of neurotic disorders. Second. If intellectual development is strong enough to resist the pressure of sexual repression, the curiosity may find alternative ways to express itself. It might resurface as compulsive reasoning, distorted but powerful enough to sexualize thoughts and intensify intellectual processes with the pleasure and anxiety associated with sexuality. In this case, the investigation becomes a substitute for sexual activity, offering a sense of problem solving and mental gratification. However, the endless nature of this reasoning and the inability to reach a definitive solution persist. Lastly, in the rare and ideal third scenario, the curiosity manages to escape the inhibition and compulsive reasoning. Although sexual repression occurs, the libido is sublimated from the beginning into curiosity, reinforcing the investigative impulse. Here, the investigation may still be somewhat compulsive and serve as a substitute for sexual activity. However, due to the fundamental difference in the underlying psychological process, sublimation instead of emerging from the unconscious, the character of neurosis does not manifest. The person is liberated from the original complexes associated with childhood sexual exploration, allowing the impulse to freely serve intellectual interests. This impulse acknowledges the sexual repression that strengthened it by avoiding engagement with sexual themes. When we examine Leonardo da Vinci's life, we notice a combination of a strong drive for exploration and a limited sexual life that revolved around idealized same-sex relationships. This makes him a prime example of our third type. The key aspect of his character, and its secret, seems to lie in the fact that he managed to channel a significant portion of his sexual energy, known as libido, into his investigative pursuits after initially using his childhood curiosity for sexual interests. However, proving this idea is challenging. To truly understand his early psychological development, we would need insight into his early childhood years. Unfortunately, the information available about his life is scarce and unreliable, making it unlikely that we will obtain such material, especially considering that even individuals of our own generation tend to keep such personal information private. 
Regarding Leonardo's youth, we have very limited knowledge. He was born in 1452 in Vinci, a small city situated between Florence and Empoli. Being an illegitimate child was not considered a major social stigma during that time. His father, Ser Piero da Vinci, was a notary and came from a lineage of notaries and farmers associated with the place Vinci. His mother, a woman named Caterina, was likely a peasant girl who later married another local resident from Vinci. There is little else mentioned about Leonardo's mother in his life history, except for some traces suggested by the writer Marikovsky. The only concrete information about Leonardo's childhood comes from a legal document dating back to 1457 which lists Leonardo, then a five-year-old illegitimate child of Ser Piero, among the members of the Vinci family. Since Ser Piero's marriage to Donna Alviera was childless, young Leonardo was allowed to be raised in his father's household. He left his father's house only when he became an apprentice in the art studio of Andrea da Verrocchio, although the exact year of this is unknown. Leonardo's name appears in the register of members of the Compagna dei Pittori in 1472. And that's all we know. Chapter 2 as far as I know, Leonardo only briefly mentions one childhood memory in one of his scientific descriptions. In a passage discussing the flight of a vulture, he suddenly digresses to recall a very early memory that came to his mind. It seems that it had been destined before that I should occupy myself so thoroughly with the vulture, for it comes to my mind as a very early memory. When I was still in the cradle, a vulture came down to me, he opened my mouth with his tail, and struck me a few times with his tail inside my lips. This memory is quite bizarre due to its content and the period of life in which it supposedly occurred. While it is not impossible for a person to retain memories from the nursing period, it cannot be regarded as certain. Moreover, the specific claim made by Leonardo's memory that a vulture opened his mouth with its tail sounds highly improbable and fantastical. Therefore, an alternative interpretation that resolves both of these difficulties appears more reasonable to us. The scene involving the vulture is not an authentic memory of Leonardo's, but rather a later fantasy that he projected onto his childhood. Childhood memories often have a different origin than conscious memories from adulthood. In fact, they are not formed until a later period when childhood has already passed. These memories undergo changes, disguises, and serve later tendencies. As a result, they cannot be strictly distinguished from fantasies. To better understand their nature, we can draw an analogy to the origins of historical writing among ancient civilizations. In the early stages, when a nation is small and weak, it prioritizes its survival, land acquisition, and wealth accumulation, neglecting the recording of its history. This is the heroic yet non-historic period. Later, during a period of self-realization when the nation feels powerful and prosperous, the desire to discover its origins and development emerges. Historical writing, which documents present events, also turns its gaze to the past, collecting traditions and legends and interpreting remnants from ancient times into customs and practices, thereby constructing a history of past ages. Naturally, this historical account is primarily a reflection of present opinions and desires rather than an accurate depiction of the past. Many details are forgotten, distorted, or misinterpreted, and traces of the past are misunderstood and aligned with present beliefs. Additionally, the writing of history is not driven by objective curiosity, but rather aims to impress contemporaries, inspire and praise them, or hold a mirror up to them. In this same way, a person's conscious memory of their adult experiences can be compared to historical writing. Their childhood memories, in terms of origin and reliability, can be seen as analogous to the primitive history of a people compiled later with intentional motives. Now, one might think that if Leonardo's story of the vulture that visited him in his cradle is nothing more than a later-born fantasy, it may not be worth dedicating more time to it. It could easily be explained by his openly expressed interest in exploring the flight of birds, which would give this fantasy a sense of predetermined fate. However, by dismissing it in this way, one would be committing an injustice similar to disregarding the rich material of legends, traditions, and interpretations in the early history of a people. Despite distortions and misunderstandings, these narratives still reflect the reality of the past. They represent what the people shaped from their experiences in a bygone era, influenced by powerful motives that continue to have an impact today. If we could unravel these distortions through a comprehensive understanding of all the influential forces, we would undoubtedly discover historical truth behind this legendary material. 
The same principle applies to childhood memories and personal fantasies. What an individual believes they recall from their early years is not insignificant. Often the fragments of memory that they themselves do not fully understand hide valuable evidence regarding the most important aspects of their psychological development. As psychoanalytic techniques provide excellent means of uncovering this hidden material, we shall venture to fill the gaps in Leonardo's life history through the analysis of this childhood fantasy. Even if we don't achieve any level of certainty, we can rest assured that many other investigations into this great and enigmatic figure have at least met a similar fate. When we approach Leonardo's vulture fantasy from a psychoanalytic perspective, it no longer seems all that strange. We frequently encountered similar structures in dreams allowing us to interpret this fantasy in a universally understood manner. The translation takes an erotic direction. The tail, or coda, serves as a common symbol and also represents the male genitalia, a notion applicable not only in Italian but in other languages as well. The scenario depicted in the fantasy where a vulture opens the child's mouth and forcefully engages it with its tail corresponds to the act of fellatio. Interestingly, this fantasy exhibits a predominantly passive nature and resembles the dreams and fantasies experienced by women and passive homosexual individuals who assume the feminine role in sexual relationships. Now, I beg the reader to remain patient for a while and refrain from becoming outraged or dismissing psychoanalysis outright because its initial applications may appear to unjustly malign the memory of a great and virtuous individual. It's important to recognize that our indignation will not help us decipher the significance of Leonardo's childhood fantasy. On the contrary, Leonardo himself unequivocally acknowledged this fantasy, prompting us to maintain the expectation, or if preferred the assumption, that like any other psychological creation such as dreams, visions, and delusions, this fantasy must possess some meaning. Let us therefore open our minds without bias and listen attentively to the ongoing work of psychoanalysis, which has not yet exhausted its insights. This fantasy conceals nothing more or less than a reminiscence of the act of nursing or being nursed at the mother's breast, a profoundly human and beautiful scene that Leonardo and other artists depict through the brush in the form of the mother and child as seen in portrayals of the Virgin Mary and Jesus. Regardless, there is also an aspect we do not yet fully grasp. This reminiscence holds equal significance for both sexes, yet in Leonardo's case it developed into a passive homosexual fantasy. We will not delve into the question of the relationship between homosexuality and nursing at the mother's breast at this moment. Instead, we want to highlight the fact that tradition indeed identifies Leonardo as a person with homosexual inclinations. Whether the accusations against the young Leonardo were justified or not is irrelevant. It is the nature of the emotions and feelings, rather than the actual activities, that leads us to ascribe the characteristic of homosexuality to someone. Another perplexing aspect of Leonardo's childhood fantasy piques our curiosity. We analyze the fantasy of being nursed by the mother and find that the mother is replaced by a vulture. Where does this vulture come from and how does it enter the picture? A seemingly distant thought emerges, tempting us to dismiss it altogether. In the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, the mother figure is symbolized by a vulture. The Egyptians also worshipped a motherly deity with a vulture-like head or multiple heads, one or two of which belonged to a vulture. This goddess was called Mut, and we might question whether the resemblance in sound to our word mother, Muta, is merely coincidental. Thus the vulture indeed holds some connection to the concept of motherhood, but what relevance does that have for us? Do we have the right to attribute this knowledge to Leonardo? considering that Francois Champollion first deciphered the hieroglyphics between 1790 and 1832? It would be intriguing to explore how the ancient Egyptians came to choose the vulture as a symbol of motherhood. As a matter of fact, Egyptian religion and culture had fascinated even the Greeks and Romans as early as classical antiquity long before we ourselves could decipher Egyptian monuments. We had access to certain accounts from preserved works of familiar authors like Strabo, Plutarch, and Aminianus Marcellus, as well as some writings with uncertain origins and timelines such as Horopolonilus's Hieroglyphica and the enigmatic book of oriental priestly wisdom known as Hermes Trismegistus. These sources inform us that the vulture was associated with motherhood because it was believed that this bird species consisted solely of female vultures, without any males. Ancient natural history also presents a parallel to this peculiarity in the scarab beetles, revered by the Egyptians as divine beings, where the absence of females was believed to exist. 
But how did they believe that female vultures reproduced with no males? Horopolo's answer was that during a certain period of time these birds pause in mid-flight, open their genitalia, and become impregnated by the wind. Unexpectedly, we have now arrived at a point where we can consider something once deemed absurd as quite plausible. It is entirely feasible that Leonardo was well acquainted with a scientific fable that the Egyptians represented the notion of mother with the image of a vulture. Leonardo was a voracious reader with a wide-ranging curiosity that encompassed various literary genres and fields of knowledge. In the Codex Atlanticus, we discover an inventory of the books he owned during a specific period. Additionally, we come across numerous mentions of books he borrowed from friends, and based on the excerpts compiled from his drawings by Richter, we can scarcely overstate the breadth of his reading. Among his collection, he had access to both older and contemporary works on natural history. Interestingly, all these books were already in circulation during that era, and it's worth noting that Milan played a significant role as a hub for the flourishing art of book printing in Italy. The origin of Leonardo's vulture fantasy can be understood as follows. While reading an ancient Christian theologian's writings or a book on natural science, he came across the idea that vultures are all females and can reproduce without male involvement. This triggered a memory in him which then transformed into a fantasy of being a vulture child, a child with a mother but no father. The pleasure he experienced while nursing at his mother's breast added to this, emerging as an echo of long-forgotten impressions. The allusion to the Holy Virgin and Child, a beloved theme for artists, likely contributed to Leonardo finding this fantasy valuable and significant. It allowed him to identify himself with the Christ child, who brings solace and salvation not only to this particular woman, but to many others as well. When we deconstruct an infantile fantasy, our aim is to separate the actual memory content from the subsequent motives that modify and distort it. In Leonardo's case, we believe we have identified the true content of his fantasy. The substitution of the mother with a vulture indicates that the child yearned for the father's presence and felt alone with his mother. Leonardo's illegitimate birth aligns with this vulture fantasy as it enabled him to draw a parallel between himself and a vulture child. However, we have discovered another crucial fact from his youth. At the age of five, he had already been welcomed into his father's household. The exact timing of this, whether it occurred a few months after his birth or a few weeks before the tax assessment, remains unknown. The interpretation of the vulture fantasy suggests that Leonardo didn't spend the critical early years of his life with his father and stepmother, but rather with his impoverished and abandoned biological mother, leading him to yearn for his father's presence. Initially, this may appear as a modest and audacious result of the psychoanalytic effort, but upon further reflection, its significance becomes apparent. Providing the actual circumstances of Leonardo's childhood will increase our certainty. According to reports, Leonardo's father, Ser Piero da Vinci, married the prominent Donna Alviera around the time of Leonardo's birth. Due to the lack of children in their marriage, Leonardo was legally accepted into his father's, or rather grandfather's, household when he was five years old. However, it's not typical to entrust an illegitimate child to the care of a young woman at the beginning of her marriage, when she still hopes to have her own children. Several years of disappointment must have passed before it was decided to adopt the likely well-developed illegitimate child as a substitute for the legitimate children they had hoped for. It seems most plausible, considering the interpretation of the vulture fantasy, that at least three or perhaps five years had passed in Leonardo's life before he transitioned from his solitary life with his mother to his father's home. But by then it may have been too late. The first three or four years of life are crucial for the formation of impressions and reactions to the external world, and these early experiences retain their significance throughout one's life, unaffected by later events. If it's true that the childhood memories that we don't fully understand and the fantasies they generate reveal the most significant aspects of our psychological development, then the vulture fantasy lends support to the notion that Leonardo spent his early years alone with his mother, who must have had a profound influence on the shaping of his inner life. This particular circumstance undoubtedly led the young Leonardo to passionately ponder over the mystery of his origins, particularly the role of his father. The vague awareness of this connection between his investigations and his childhood experiences prompted him to exclaim that his destiny was intertwined with the profound study of bird flight, as he had been visited by a vulture even in his cradle. Tracing the roots of his curiosity in the flight of birds back to his early exploration of sexuality will be a subsequent task, one that should prove relatively uncomplicated. 
Chapter 3 Although we have limited knowledge about Leonardo da Vinci's sexuality, we can trust the accounts of his contemporaries to some extent. According to these testimonies, Leonardo seemed to have a remarkably low sex drive and activity, as if he was driven by higher aspirations beyond basic human needs. It's uncertain whether he actively pursued sexual gratification or if he could do without it entirely. It's reasonable to assume that he experienced emotional drives similar to others that typically lead to sexual activity. It's difficult to conceive of a human psyche that hasn't been influenced in some way by the broad concept of sexual desire, whether it deviated significantly from its original purpose or was never fulfilled. We shouldn't expect to find any solid evidence of Leonardo's sexual preferences, but there are indications that suggest he was attracted to men. It has been noted that he only selected exceptionally good-looking boys and young men as his students. He was kind and caring towards them, nurturing them when they were sick, much like a mother would care for her children. Since he chose his pupils based on their physical beauty rather than their talent, none of them became well-known artists. Most of them were unable to establish themselves independently and faded into obscurity after Leonardo's death, leaving little impact on the history of art. As for those who did achieve recognition as a student, like Luini and Bazzi, nicknamed Sodoma, Leonardo probably didn't have personal acquaintance with them. We acknowledge that an objection may arise, suggesting that Leonardo's behavior towards his pupils had nothing to do with sexual motives and does not imply any specific sexual orientation. We cautiously assert that our interpretation sheds light on certain peculiar aspects of the master's behavior that would otherwise remain a mystery. Leonardo kept a personal diary, writing from right to left, intended only for himself. It's worth noting that in this diary he referred to himself as thou. For example, he wrote, Let Master Dabaco show thee the square of the circle. During a journey he made entries like, I am going to Milan to take care of my garden. Order two pack sacks to be made. Ask Boltrafio to show thee his turning lathe and let him polish a stone on it. Leave the book for Master Andrea Il Tolesco. Additionally, he wrote this significant resolution. Thou must demonstrate in thy treatise that the earth is a star, similar to or resembling the moon, and thus establish the greatness of our world. In Leonardo's diary, there are a few entries that stand out and are mentioned by all of his biographers. These entries are peculiar because they focus on Leonardo's small expenses, which he meticulously records as if he were a strict and frugal family man. One of these entries gives a detailed record revealing the expenses Leonardo incurred due to the bad behavior and stealing tendencies of one of his pupils. On April 21st, 1490, he began this account and noted that Giacomo, a ten-year-old boy described as thievish, dishonest, stubborn, and gluttonous, came to live with him. On the second day, Leonardo ordered two shirts, a pair of pants, and a jacket for Giacomo. However, Giacomo stole the money from Leonardo that was intended to pay for these items. Despite Leonardo's certainty of Giacomo's guilt, he could never make him confess. The report goes on to detail further misdeeds by the boy and concludes with an expense list for the first year, including a cloak, six shirts, three jackets, and four pairs of socks. Leonardo's biographers, who are not interested in exploring the psychological aspects of their hero's life through these minor flaws and peculiarities, often commented on the master's kindness and consideration towards his pupils in relation to these accounts. But they fail to acknowledge that it is not Leonardo's behavior that requires an explanation, but rather the fact that he left us these records. Since it is unlikely that Leonardo's intention was to provide evidence of his kindness, we must assume that there was another emotional motive behind his documentation. To shed light on these seemingly trivial notes about his pupils' clothing and similar matters, we can turn to another account found among Leonardo's papers. The author Merikovsky is the only one who provides information about a woman named Katarina, who he believes was Leonardo's mother. According to Merikovsky, Katarina, a poor peasant woman from Vinci, visited her 41-year-old son in Milan in 1493. During her visit, she fell ill and Leonardo took her to the hospital. After her death, Leonardo arranged an extravagant funeral for her. While this deduction cannot be proven, it aligns with what we know about Leonardo's emotional life. Leonardo managed to suppress his feelings and investigate them, but there were occasions when his repressed emotions found expression. The death of his beloved mother was one such instance. The account of the lavish funeral expenses represents Leonardo's mourning in a distorted and almost unrecognizable manner. 
This distortion is difficult to comprehend using normal psychological processes. We see similar phenomena in abnormal conditions like neuroses, particularly in compulsive neurosis. In this context, intense feelings are displaced and expressed through trivial or foolish actions. The opposing forces succeed in diminishing the significance of these feelings, but the imperative compulsion behind these seemingly insignificant acts reveals the true force of the unconscious feelings that consciousness seeks to deny. Leonardo's account of his mother's funeral expenses can be explained by understanding the mechanisms of compulsive neurosis. In his unconscious, he remained emotionally attached to her, similar to how he was in childhood with a touch of eroticism. The repression of this childhood love prevented him from creating a different and more dignified memorial for her in his diary. The compromise resulting from his neurotic conflict led to the inclusion of the funeral expenses in his diary, which subsequently became known to future generations as something incomprehensible. Applying the interpretation derived from the funeral expenses to his accounts of his pupils, we can suggest that Leonardo's limited remnants of libidinous feelings also found a distorted expression compulsively. The pupils, reminiscent of his own youthful beauty, would serve as his sexual objects, to the extent allowed by his dominant sexual repression. The compulsion to meticulously record his expenses on their behalf represents the peculiar manifestation of his underlying conflicts. Chapter 4 the inherent ability of a real artist is to express their deepest inner emotions through their artistic creations, even ones that remain concealed from their own awareness. These expressions possess a remarkable power to evoke intense emotions in those who encounter them, even if they cannot pinpoint the exact source of such emotive impact. Is it not reasonable to expect that Leonardo's most profound childhood impressions would leave traces in his work? One would assume so. However, we must acknowledge the substantial transformations that an artist's impressions undergo before they contribute to the final artwork. Thus, our expectations of finding concrete evidence must be considerably tempered. When we think about Leonardo's paintings, we can't help but be captivated by the mesmerizing and mysterious smile he bestowed upon the lips of his female figures. This fixed smile, adorning elongated and graceful lips, has become synonymous with his art and is commonly referred to as Leonardo-esque. In the one-of-a-kind and exquisite face of the Mona Lisa, this smile has had an immense impact on viewers, often leaving them bewildered. Numerous attempts have been made to interpret this smile with a wide range of explanations, yet none have been universally deemed satisfactory. As Gruyer puts it, it is almost four centuries since Mona Lisa causes all those to lose their heads who have looked upon her for some time. Mother states, What fascinates the spectator is the demoniacal charm of this smile. Hundreds of poets and writers have written about this woman who now seems to smile upon us seductively and now to stare coldly and lifelessly into space, but nobody has solved the riddle of her smile. Nobody has interpreted her thoughts. Everything, even the scenery, is mysterious and dreamlike, trembling as if in the sultriness of sensuality. Many critics have perceived the notion that the smile of Mona Lisa encompasses the union of two contrasting elements. They discern in the subtle interplay of features on the countenance of the exquisite Florentine lady a flawless portrayal of the conflicting dynamics that govern a woman's love life which may elude men. These dynamics include a blend of restraint and allure, as well as a simultaneous display of utmost devotion and thoughtlessness in moments of passionate and consuming sensuality. Muntz, in his own words, articulates this sentiment. One knows what indecipherable and fascinating enigma Mona Lisa Gioconda has been putting for nearly four centuries to the admirers who crowd around her. No artist has ever translated in this manner the very essence of femininity, the tenderness and coquetry, the modesty and quiet voluptuousness, the whole mystery of the heart which holds itself aloof, of a brain which reflects, and of a personality who watches itself and yields nothing from herself except radiance. The Italian Angelo Conti saw the painting in the Louvre with a ray of sun shining down on it and expressed himself as follows. The woman smiled with a royal calmness, her instincts of conquest, of ferocity, the entire heredity of the species, the will of seduction and ensnaring, the charm of the deceiver, the kindness which conceals a cruel purpose, all that appears and disappears alternately behind the laughing veil and melts into the poem of her smile. Good and evil, cruelty and compassion, graceful and cat-like, she laughed. Leonardo worked on this painting for a span of four years, possibly from 1503 to 1507, during his second stay in Florence, when he was around 50 years old. 
According to Vasari, he employed various clever tactics to keep the lady engaged and maintain that captivating smile on her face throughout the sittings. Unfortunately, much of the original gracefulness that his brush captured during that time has been lost in its current state. Despite being hailed as the pinnacle of artistic achievement during its creation, Leonardo himself was not satisfied with it. He deemed it unfinished and did not deliver it to the patron who commissioned it. Instead, he took it with him to France, where his patron, Francis I, acquired it for the Louvre. Let's set aside the unsolved mystery of Mona Lisa's enigmatic smile and acknowledge the indisputable fact that her smile has fascinated not only the artist, but also every spectator for the past four centuries. This captivating smile subsequently reappeared in all of Leonardo's own paintings and those created by his students. Since Leonardo's Mona Lisa was a portrait, we shouldn't assume that he added to her face a trait so intricately elusive that she herself did not possess. It appears, and we can hardly deny it, that he discovered this smile in his model and became so enchanted by it that he painted it on all the imaginative creations of his mind. This apparent notion is expressed by A. Constantinova in the following manner. During the long period in which the master occupied himself with a portrait of Mona Lisa del Gioconda, he entered into the physiognomic delicacies of this feminine face with such sympathy of feeling that he transferred these creatures, especially the mysterious smile and the peculiar glance, to all faces which he later painted or drew. The mimic peculiarity of Gioconda can even be perceived in the picture of John the Baptist in the Louvre, but above all they are distinctly recognized in the features of Mary in the picture of St. Anne of the Louvre. However, it's possible that the situation was quite different. Several of Leonardo's biographers have recognized the necessity for a deeper explanation behind the captivating power that Mona Lisa's smile held over the artist, a fascination he could not shake off. W. Potter, for instance, perceives in the portrait of Mona Lisa the embodiment of the complete erotic encounter of contemporary humanity. He eloquently reflects on that impenetrable smile, always tinged with a hint of something ominous, which permeates all of Leonardo's creations. Hertzfeld stated that Leonardo saw himself in the Mona Lisa, and therefore found it possible to put so much of his own nature into the painting, whose features from time immemorial have been embedded with mysterious sympathy in Leonardo's soul. Let's make an effort to elucidate these hints. It's plausible that Leonardo found himself captivated by Mona Lisa's smile because it had stirred something within him something that had long slumbered in the depths of his soul, most likely a childhood memory. Once awakened, this memory held such significance that it clung to him persistently, compelling him to continually seek new ways to give it expression. Pater's assertion that we can observe an image akin to that of Mona Lisa forming itself within Leonardo's dreams from his childhood onward carries a credible weight and deserves to be taken seriously. Vasari mentions that Leonardo's first artistic endeavors were heads of women who laugh, the passage, which is completely reliable as it's not meant to prove anything, exactly reads as follows. He formed in his youth some laughing feminine heads out of lime, which have been reproduced in plaster, and some heads of children which were as beautiful as if modeled by the hands of a master. As we delve deeper, it begins to dawn on us that his mother may have held that mysterious smile that he somehow misplaced, and it captivated him profoundly when he chanced upon it once more in The Lady from Florence. Among the entries in Leonardo's diaries, there is one which captivates the reader's attention by its important content and on account of a minor mistake. He wrote, On the 9th of July, 1504, Wednesday, at 7 o'clock, died Ser Piero da Vinci, notary at the palace of the Podesta, my father, at 7 o'clock. He was 80 years old, left 10 sons and 2 daughters. The entry as we see concerns the death of his father. The minor error is the repetition of the phrase at seven o'clock in stating the time, as if Leonardo had forgotten that he had already mentioned it earlier in the sentence. This mistake may not seem important to most people, except for a psychoanalyst who recognizes the potential significance behind such slips. The psychoanalyst understands that such forgetting or repetition can reveal hidden psychological processes and even a seemingly trivial error can hold deeper meaning. Similar to the funeral account of Caterina and the expense account of the pupils, this notice also reflects a situation where Leonardo failed to suppress his emotions and his long-concealed feelings found a distorted expression. Furthermore, the form of the notice exhibits the same meticulous precision and emphasis on numbers. In psychological terms, this repetition is referred to as perseveration which serves as an effective indicator of heightened emotional intensity. 
If Leonardo had not held back his emotions, the diary entry might have read like this. Today at seven o'clock, my father, Ser Piero da Vinci, passed away. Oh, my poor father! However, the displacement of perseveration to the seemingly insignificant detail of the time of death strips the notice of its emotional intensity, revealing that there was something to be concealed and suppressed. Ser Piero da Vinci, a notary and descendant of notaries, was a highly energetic man who achieved respect and prosperity. He went through four marriages with the first two wives dying without bearing children. It was only in his third marriage that he had his first legitimate son in 1476 when Leonardo was already 24 years old and had long left his father's home to study under his master Verrocchio. In his fifties, Ser Piero married for the fourth and final time and fathered nine sons and two daughters. No doubt Leonardo's father played a significant role in his psychosexual development. Not only did his absence during Leonardo's early childhood have an impact, but his direct presence in later years also shaped him. During the time when a child yearns for his mother, it's natural for him to desire to step into his father's shoes, to identify with him in his fantasies, and eventually to make it his life's mission to surpass him. When Leonardo was received into his father's home at the tender age of five, his young stepmother, Alvieta, undoubtedly assumed the role of his mother figure, fostering a sense of rivalry with his father, which can be considered normal. It's important to note that Leonardo's preference for homosexuality did not manifest until his pubescent years. Once he embraced this preference, the identification with his father lost its sexual significance, but continued to influence other areas of non-erotic activities. Reports suggest that he had a fondness for luxury, elegant clothing, and kept a lot of servants and horses, despite Vasari's claim that he hardly possessed anything and worked little. While his artistic taste may not entirely account for these preferences, they reveal his compulsion to emulate and surpass his father. Leonardo played the role of a distinguished gentleman to the peasant girl, and thus he harbored a strong desire to outshine his father and demonstrate what true nobility looked like. Every artist, without a doubt, feels like a father to his work. Leonardo experienced a significant influence from his identification with his father, which had a profound impact on his artistic creations. He would bring them to life and then detach himself from them, much like his father showed little concern for him. The later worries and troubles faced by his father held no power to alter this compulsion, as it stemmed from the impressions of his early childhood and remained deeply ingrained in his unconscious, impervious to later experiences. During the Renaissance and even beyond, artists depended on patrons of noble rank to support them. These patrons would commission their work and hold complete control over their destinies, Leonardo found his patron in Lodovico Sforza, known as Il Moro, a man with great ambitions, a flair for ostentation, diplomatic shrewdness, but an unstable and unreliable character. It was during his time in Sforza's court in Milan that Leonardo experienced the most fruitful period of his life. He exhibited his unrestricted creativity through his renowned works such as The Last Supper and the horse statue of Francesco Sforza. He left Milan before catastrophe struck Lodovico Moro, who died a prisoner in a French jail cell. When the news of his benefactor's fate reached Leonardo, he made the following entry in his diary. The Duke has lost state, wealth, and liberty. Not one of his works will be finished by himself. It's remarkable and undoubtedly meaningful that he directed the same reproach towards his benefactor that future generations would attribute to him, as if he intended to place the responsibility on someone who had assumed the role of his substitute father for his own tendency to leave his works unfinished. However, if Leonardo's artistic imitation of his father caused him distress, it was his resistance against his father that became the driving force behind his remarkable achievements as an artist. Merikovsky beautifully compared him to a man who awakened too early in the darkness, while others still slumbered. Leonardo dared to express a bold principle that encapsulates the rationale behind all independent inquiry. Whoever refers to authorities in disputing ideas works with their memory rather than their reason. In doing so, he emerged as the first modern natural philosopher, rewarded with a wealth of knowledge and insights. Since the Greek era, he was the first to delve into the mysteries of nature, relying solely on his observations and personal judgment. As he learned to devalue authority and reject blind imitation of the ancients, continuously emphasizing the study of nature as the wellspring of wisdom, he echoed the same sentiment he had as a curious young boy exploring the world. To translate these scientific abstractions into tangible personal experiences, we could say that the ancients and authority symbolized the father figure, while nature once again became the nurturing mother who fed his intellectual growth. 
In most individuals today, as in primitive times, the need for an authoritative foundation is so deeply ingrained that their world trembles when that authority is threatened. However, Leonardo alone possessed the ability to exist without such support, a feat made possible by his father's absence during his formative years. The audacity and independence he displayed in his scientific investigations presuppose that his exploration of sexuality as a child was unhindered by paternal inhibition. The same spirit of scientific independence continued as he distanced himself from matters of sexuality. If someone like Leonardo manages to escape his father's intimidation during childhood and subsequently breaks free from the constraints of authority in his scientific pursuits, it would be highly contradictory if he were to remain a devout believer unable to disengage from dogmatic religious beliefs. Psychoanalysis has illuminated the profound link between the father complex and faith in God, consistently revealing how young individuals relinquish their religious convictions once the authority of the father figure weakens. In the realm of paternal dynamics, we recognize the deep-seated origins of a human religious impulse. The concept of an all-powerful, just God and a benevolent nature emerges as a lofty sublimation of the father and mother figures, or rather as a revival and restoration of the child's early conceptions of their parents. Religious inclination can be biologically traced back to the prolonged period of helplessness and dependence experienced during infancy. As the child matures and becomes aware of his own vulnerability and insignificance in the face of life's great forces, he reverts to a regressive yearning for the protective forces of his childhood, seeking solace and denying his despair. It appears that Leonardo's life does not contradict this understanding of religious belief. During his lifetime, he faced accusations of being irreligious, a charge that in those times equated to renouncing Christianity. These allegations were already documented and vividly described in Vasari's initial biography of Leonardo. However, in the subsequent edition of his work, published in 1568, Vasari omitted these observations. Considering the heightened sensitivity of Leonardo's era towards religious matters, we can fully comprehend why he refrained from expressing his stance on Christianity in his writings. As an inquisitive investigator, he refused to be swayed by the accounts presented in Holy Scriptures. For example, he challenged the plausibility of a universal flood, and in the realm of geology, he fearlessly employed calculations involving hundreds of thousands of years, paralleling the audacity exhibited by contemporary researchers. In Leonardo's prophecies, there are certain passages that would undoubtedly challenge the sensibilities of devout Christians. For instance, one of his remarks about praying to the images of saints reads as follows. People engage in conversation with those who remain oblivious, with open eyes that perceive nothing. They shall speak to them and receive no response. They shall adore those who possess ears but hear nothing. They shall kindle lamps for those who lack vision. Likewise, regarding mourning on Good Friday, he states, In various parts of Europe, large populations shall lament the death of a man who passed away in the East. Critics of Leonardo's art claim that he eliminated the remnants of religious reverence from sacred figures, transforming them into human forms to portray profound and beautiful human emotions. Muther commended him for transcending the sense of decay and restoring to humanity the rights of sensuality and pleasurable enjoyment. While his writings and observations on unraveling the mysteries of nature contain expressions of admirations for a creator, there is no indication that he sought a personal connection to this divine force. The profound wisdom that he had in his later years reflects the resignation of a man who submits to the laws of nature, expecting no solace from the benevolence or grace of God. There's little doubt that Leonardo had overcome both dogmatic and personal religious beliefs. Through his investigative work, he distanced himself significantly from the religious Christian worldview. Considering our earlier insights into the development of childhood psychic life, it becomes apparent that Leonardo's initial explorations were preoccupied with matters of sexuality. However, he subtly reveals this to us through a translucent veil, linking his investigative drive to the fantasy of the vulture, and highlighting the problem of the flight of birds as a subject that fate particularly assigned to him. In one enigmatic yet prophetic passage in his notes on bird flight, he vividly illustrates the profound effective interest he held in his desire to imitate the art of flying. The human bird shall take his first flight astonishing the world, filling all writings with his renown, and bringing eternal glory to the nest from which he sprang. It's plausible that he harbored hopes of achieving personal flight, and from our understanding of wish-fulfilling dreams, we know the bliss one anticipates from the fulfillment of such aspirations. But why is it that so many people dream of being able to fly? 
Psychoanalysis provides an answer by asserting that in dreams the act of flying or being a bird serves as a cover for another underlying wish, which can be uncovered through various linguistic or objective associations. When a curious child is told that a large bird like a stork brings newborns, when ancient depictions depict the phallus as winged, when the German language uses the word to bird as a colloquial expression for sexual activity, or when the Italians directly refer to the male member as lucello, bird, these are all fragments that collectively indicate that the desire to fly in dreams represents nothing more or less than a longing for sexual fulfillment. This wish traces back to early infancy. When adults reminisce about their childhood, it often appears as a joyous time filled with carefree moments and a sense of looking forward without any desires. This is why adults often envy children. But if children themselves could communicate their experiences, they would likely provide different accounts. Childhood is not the idyllic paradise we tend to romanticize it as. On the contrary, children are driven throughout their years of childhood by the wish to grow up and emulate adults. This desire fuels their playfulness. When children sense that grown-ups possess knowledge of something fascinating and significant in the mysterious realm they are prohibited from fully understanding or engaging in, an intense desire to acquire that knowledge arises within them. They dream of it in the form of flying or create this disguise for their future dreams of flight. Thus aviation, which has now achieved its goal in our time, also has its origins in the erotic impulses of childhood. Leonardo's admission that he maintained a personal connection to the concept of flight since his childhood supports what we can deduce from our observations of children today. It suggests that his childhood explorations were focused on sexual matters. At least in this particular aspect, it seems that he managed to preserve his interest from childhood until reaching intellectual maturity. However, it's entirely possible that he found as little success in his cherished art in the primary sexual sense as he did in his mechanical pursuits, as both desires remained unfulfilled for him. The truth is that Leonardo, the great genius, retained certain childlike qualities throughout his entire life. It's often said that all great individuals retain a trace of their inner child. Even as an adult, Leonardo continued to engage in play, which sometimes made him appear eccentric and bizarre to his contemporaries. When he crafted intricately artistic mechanical toys for court festivities and gatherings, we may feel a sense of disappointment as we prefer to witness the master employing his talents for more profound endeavors. However, Leonardo himself did not seem to shy away from investing his time in such pursuits. His fables and riddles also exemplify the same playful delight in harmless concealment and artistic imagination. The riddles took the form of prophecies, and nearly all of them abound with profound ideas, although they often lack a normal sense of humor. Leonardo's playful and imaginative nature has often led to misunderstandings among his biographers. In his manuscripts from his time in Milan, there are outlines of letters addressed to the Diodario of Sorio, Syria, Viceroy of the Holy Sultan of Babylon. In these letters, Leonardo presents himself as an engineer sent to the Orient to undertake various construction projects. He defends himself against accusations of laziness, provides geographical descriptions, and even discusses a significant event that occurred during his supposed time there. In 1881, J.P. Richter attempted to argue that these documents proved Leonardo's actual travels in the service of the Sultan of Egypt, suggesting that he even became a Muslim during his time in the East. Other scholars easily recognized these illustrations and accounts as the fantastic creations of a young artist, expression of his desire for adventure and exploration rather than actual experiences. Another example of Leonardo's imaginative ventures is the Academia Vinciana, which some believe to be real due to the existence of five or six intricate emblems bearing the Academy's name. While Vasari mentions these drawings, he does not mention the Academy itself. Only a few, like Muntz, who featured such imagery on the cover of their work on Leonardo, believe in the existence of an Academia Vinciana. It's likely that Leonardo's tendency for playfulness diminished as he matured, finding its outlet in his relentless pursuit of knowledge and scientific investigation, which represented the pinnacle of his personal development. The fact that his playful nature persisted for so long reminds us of the gradual process of outgrowing infantile tendencies after experiencing profound childhood joys that can never be recaptured. Chapter 5 we know that some readers may reject certain psychological struggles that a well-known person has gone through. They argue that delving into the hardships faced by remarkable individuals does not provide a true understanding of their significance and achievements. It is believed that studying such matters would be a futile exercise, as similar experiences can be found in anyone's life. But this critique is unjust and reveals itself to be a mere pretext or disguise for something else. In reality, the purpose of exploring personal struggles is not to make the achievements of great individuals more comprehensible. 
no one should be blamed for not fulfilling a promise they never made. The true motives behind the opposition to such narratives are quite different. These motives become evident when we consider that biographers often become deeply attached to their subjects in a unique way. Frequently they choose to study a particular hero due to a personal emotional connection, harboring a special affection for them from the beginning. They then dedicate themselves to idealizing their subjects, aiming to place these great figures on a pedestal akin to their childhood role models. In doing so, they erase the individual traits from their subjects' character and overlook their struggles against internal and external challenges. They refuse to acknowledge any human weaknesses or imperfections, presenting us with a distant, idealized form instead of a relatable individual. It's unfortunate that they engage in this practice as they sacrifice truth for illusion. By clinging to their own childhood fantasies, they miss out on the opportunity to uncover the most captivating mysteries of human nature. Leonardo himself, given his love for truth and curiosity, would likely have welcomed the effort to uncover the details of his psychological and intellectual development from the seemingly insignificant peculiarities and mysteries of his nature. We honor him by learning from his experiences. It does not diminish his greatness to study the sacrifices he made during his growth from childhood and to understand the factors that contributed to the tragic aspect of his failures. Let's make it clear that we've never viewed Leonardo as a neurotic or a nervous person in the sense of that outdated term. Those who take offense at our application of pathological perspectives to him are holding onto prejudices that we have rightly abandoned. Nowadays, we recognize that health and illness, normality and neurosis are not strictly separate categories, and that neurotic tendencies should not be regarded as evidence of general inferiority. We now understand that neurotic symptoms are substitute formations that arise as a result of repressive actions necessary for our development from childhood to adulthood. We all produce such substitute formations, and it's only the quantity, intensity, and distribution of these substitutes that justify the practical concept of illness and the conclusion of constitutional inferiority. Considering the subtle signs in Leonardo's personality, we would place him in the category of the compulsive type, often observed in neurotics, and we would compare his investigative nature to the reasoning mania seen in neurotic individuals, and his inhibitions to the so-called abulias exhibited by them. The aim of our study was to explain the inhibitions present in Leonardo's sexual life and artistic activity. To accomplish this, we will now summarize what we have discovered about the trajectory of his psychological development. Due to his illegitimate birth, Leonardo was deprived of a father's influence until perhaps his fifth year. His inclination for observation and inquisitiveness were greatly stimulated by his early childhood experiences. A forceful repression led to the formation of dispositions that became evident during his adolescence. The most notable outcome of this transformation was his detachment from many gross sensual activities. Leonardo was capable of leading a life of abstinence and gave the impression of being asexual. When the waves of pubescent excitement overwhelmed him, they did not make him ill by driving him towards costly and harmful substitute behaviors. Thanks to his early fascination with sexual curiosity, a significant portion of his sexual needs could be sublimated into a general thirst for knowledge, thus evading repression. Only a smaller portion of his libido was directed towards sexual aims, representing his limited sexual life as an adult. As a result of repressing his love for his mother, this portion took on a homosexual inclination, expressing itself as idealized love for boys. The fixation on his mother persisted in his unconscious mind, but remained inactive for a period of time. This way, repression, fixation, and sublimation all played a role in managing the contributions made by the sexual impulse to Leonardo's psychological life. From the early stages of Leonardo's childhood, he already exhibited artistic talents as a painter and sculptor likely due to the natural inclination for observation, which awakened at a young age. While we normally would be interested in exploring how artistic activity relies on primitive psychic forces, we simply don't have enough information about this. However, one undisputed fact remains, and artists' creations often serve as an outlet for their sexual desires. In Leonardo's case, we can refer to Vasari's account, which mentions that his initial artistic attempts included depictions of laughing women and attractive boys, representing his sexual interests. During his productive and vibrant youth, Leonardo initially worked without inhibitions. Taking his father as a role model for his external behavior, he experienced a period of powerful creativity and artistic output in Milan, where he found a substitute father figure in the Duke Ludovico Moro, fortunate in his circumstances. Yet, like others before him, he soon realized that suppressing his sexual life did not provide the most favorable conditions for the manifestation of sublimated sexual drives. The figurative aspect of his sexual life emerged, and his activity and decisive abilities began to wane. 
The inclination towards reflection and hesitation became evident, disrupting his work on the Last Supper, where technical factors also influenced the fate of his magnificent piece. Gradually, a process unfolded within him that can only be compared to the regressions observed in neurotics. His development as an artist during puberty was overtaken by the early childhood determinant of the investigator. The second sublimation of his erotic impulses regressed to the primitive one that had been established during initial repression. He transformed into an investigator, initially serving his art and later pursuing independent inquiries beyond his art. With the loss of his patron, who had served as a father's substitute, and as his life's challenges grew, the regressive displacement expanded. He became most impatient with the brush, as reported by a correspondent of Countess Isabella d'Este, who eagerly sought to acquire one of his paintings at any cost. His infantile past had gained control over him. The investigative pursuit, which now took precedence over his artistic production, seemed to exhibit certain traits revealing the influence of unconscious impulses. This was evident in his insatiable nature, his stubbornness without regard for consequences, and his inability to adapt to current circumstances. At the pinnacle of his life in his early fifties, a time when women generally experience less sexual urges, and men often feel a surge of energy, Leonardo underwent a new transformation. Deeper layers of his psyche became active once again, but this regression proved beneficial for his art, which had been in a state of decline. He encountered a woman who stirred in him memories of his mother's joyful and sensually enraptured smile. Under the influence of this awakening, he regained the inspiration that guided him in his early artistic endeavors when he portrayed smiling women. He painted the Mona Lisa, Saint Anne, and several mystic works characterized by enigmatic smiles. Through the rekindling of his oldest erotic emotions, he was triumphant in overcoming the inhibition that had plagued his art. This final phase of development gradually faded into obscurity with the approach of old age. However, prior to this, his intellect reached its highest capacity, offering a perspective on life far ahead of his time. In the previous chapters, I have presented a justification for such an interpretation of Leonardo's psychological development to explain why he always shifted back and forth between art and science. If, in accomplishing these things, I provoke criticism, even from friends and adherents of psychoanalysis, suggesting that I've merely penned a psychoanalytic novella, I would respond that I have certainly not overestimated the reliability of these findings. Like others, I have succumbed to the allure emanating from this great and mysterious figure whose being seems to exude powerful yet subtly subdued passions. Regardless of the ultimate truth about Leonardo's life, we cannot abandon our endeavor to investigate it psychoanalytically until we have completed another task. In general, we must dissolve the boundaries that delimit the capacity of psychoanalysis and biography, so that every omitted explanation is not regarded as a failure. Psychoanalytic inquiry relies on the available historical data of a person's life, encompassing both random events and environmental influences, as well as the reported reactions of the individual. Building upon knowledge of psychological mechanisms, it seeks to dynamically explore the individual's character through their reactions, revealing their earliest psychic motivations and their subsequent transformations and developments. If successful, this process explains the individual's responses through the interplay of constitutional and incidental factors, as well as internal and external forces. If, as in the case of Leonardo, such an endeavor does not yield definitive results, the blame should not be placed on the flawed or inadequate methods of psychoanalysis, but rather on the vague and fragmentary material that tradition has left us about this individual. Consequently, it's only me, the author, who, by compelling psychoanalysis to provide an expert assessment based on insufficient material, should be held accountable for any perceived shortcomings. Even with access to abundant historical material and a thorough understanding of psychic mechanisms, a psychoanalytic investigation cannot definitively determine that an individual could only turn out a certain way and not differently, especially when it pertains to two crucial questions. In Leonardo's case, we propose the view that the accident of his illegitimate birth and the doting of his mother exerted the most influential role in shaping his character and determining his later destiny. The sexual repression that followed this early phase led him to sublimate his libido into a thirst for knowledge, resulting in his lifelong sexual inactivity. But the repression that followed the initial childhood erotic gratification did not necessarily have to occur, and in another individual it may not have occurred to the same extent. We must acknowledge a degree of freedom that cannot be resolved through psychoanalysis alone. It's not justifiable to present the outcome of this shift of repression as the only possible outcome. It's very likely that another person would not have succeeded in diverting the main portion of their libido from repression through sublimation into a thirst for knowledge. 
under the same influences as Leonardo, another person might have experienced lasting damage to their intellectual work or developed an uncontrollable disposition towards compulsive neurosis. The two aspects of Leonardo's character that remain unexplained through psychoanalytic efforts are his specific inclination towards repressing his impulses and his extraordinary ability to sublimate primitive urges. The understanding of impulses and their transformations represents the limit of psychoanalysis. Beyond this point, the field is handed over to biological investigation. The inclination towards repression and the capacity for sublimation must be traced back to the organic foundations of one's character, upon which the psychological structure is built. As artistic talent and creative ability are closely linked to sublimation, we must acknowledge that the true nature of artistic achievement is beyond the reach of psychoanalysis. Contemporary biological research aims to explain the fundamental traits of an individual's organic constitution through the amalgamation of male and female predispositions in a material sense, and Leonardo's physical beauty and left-handedness lend some support to this notion. Our intention is to stay within the realm of pure psychological investigation. Our goal remains to illustrate the connection between external experiences and the individual's reactions, tracing the path of impulse activity. While psychoanalysis may not provide a complete explanation for Leonardo's artistic accomplishments, it does offer insight into his expressions and limitations. It appears that only a man with Leonardo's childhood experiences could have painted the Mona Lisa and St. Anne, infusing his works with a sense of melancholy fate, and achieved unparalleled fame as a natural historian. It seems as if the key to all his achievements and failures was concealed within the childhood fantasy of the vulture. We shouldn't be offended by the findings of an investigation that attributes such significant influence to the accidents in one's childhood upbringing. In Leonardo's case, his fate was tied to his illegitimate birth and the infertility of his first stepmother, Donna Alvira. Everything in our lives, starting from our very conception through the union of sperm and egg, is governed by accidents that participate in the laws and inevitabilities of nature, lacking only a connection to our desires and illusions. The classification of life's determinants into the inevitabilities of our constitution and the accidents of our childhood may still be somewhat blurry in individual cases. But there can no longer be any doubt about the crucial significance of our early childhood years. We, as human beings, each correspond to one of the countless experiments in which these reasons of nature manifest themselves through experience, as Leonardo eloquently expressed, similar to the later words of Hamlet. Nature is full of infinite reasons which can never appear in experience. The End The Mind of Leonardo da Vinci by Sigmund Freud was curated, modernized, and based off of Leonardo da Vinci, A Memory of His Childhood, by Sigmund Freud, which was published in 1916 and in the public domain. Read by Ross Persig. This has been an audiobook recording from IMU, International Municipal University. For more information about IMU and further content and experiences, please visit our YouTube page. Thank you for listening.